welcome on this tutorial on data democratization with deep learning, where we will be talking about how we can create a natural language interface for databases using deep learning. Uh, my name is George Katsoyanis. I'm joined today by my colleague, Mike Xidas. And unfortunately, Georgia could not make it to Singapore, so we will be covering uh, for her part. So I think we can agree that today we're living in the age of data where uh, a wide variety of human activities uh, uses data to make uh, choices and to gain information. And data is being continuously generated by a wide variety of sensors, systems, and algorithms. And a lot of users can benefit from this data. However, the problem is that not all users have equal access to data. And this is because uh, the sheer volume and complexity of data make it very difficult to query. And database query interfaces are notoriously user unfriendly because a user must uh, be familiar with SQL and how to write SQL queries in order to access this data. So in comes data democratization. Uh, the goal of data democratization is to empower everyone to access, use, and derive value from this data. Uh, no matter their technical expertise. So uh, its goal is to lift the technical barriers that prevent users from freely accessing this data and eliminate uh, the dependency of these users to IT experts. To achieve data democratization, uh, we must aim at designing tools that are aimed for the casual user and not for experienced users. And this is much more than just uh, creating a system. This is uh, a cultural stance. So why uh, do this with uh, natural language? This is not a new idea. In fact, this was first proposed by a pioneer of the database um, community, Ted Codd, five decades ago. And he suggested that in order to uh, lift these barriers, we must enable users uh, to be able to access data using their native languages. So in our case, uh, a user can ask the database a question in natural language, and they can receive the answer in natural language as well. And how can this be done? Uh, this is the framework of today's tutorial. We will be talking about three different types of systems. First of all, we have text to SQL systems where the user can ask a question in natural language, and their question can be translated to SQL. Then we have SQL to text systems that allow the user to understand the produced SQL query and to verify that the prediction of the text to SQL system was correct. And when they have verified this prediction, the query can be executed on the database. And then we have data to text systems that take the data output and they can verbalize it back to natural language so that the user gets a complete natural language experience. So the outline of today's tutorial uh, has three parts that cover these three systems and the fourth part where we will be discussing how we can bring this all together to create a natural language interface. So first of all is the text to SQL problem. Simply put, the text to SQL problem says that when we're given a relational database and the natural language question posed on that database, uh, we want to create an SQL query that has the same meaning as the natural language question and that this SQL query must be valid to be executed on this database and it should return the results that the user wanted. This is not a new problem. In fact, this has been studied uh, for many decades by the database community because it would open up access to databases using only natural language. And there have been many efforts uh, from the database community. However, this is a very difficult problem, and we will see now why. First of all, from the natural language side of the problem, uh, natural language is a very complex thing. It can be ambiguous, that which means that a word might have different interpretation. It, it might refer to different things. For example, Paris might be a city or it might be a person. Uh, it can have references to the database that are not clear to resolve. For example, the word model 
might refer to a car model in the database or an engine model. It might infer things that are easy to understand for a person, but difficult to understand for a computer. For example, when we say, uh, who was the president before Obama? We're talking about the president of the United States, and this might be clear uh, for humans, but uh, it's not that clear for a computer. Uh, additionally, the user might use a different vocabulary than the, than the vocabulary that is used to create the database. So uh, a user might ask for the composer of the song, but the database might have this information stored as the songwriter of the song. And of course, since we're dealing with users, we should expect a lot of mistakes, such as spelling mistakes and syntactical and grammatical mistakes. On the other hand, on the SQL side of the problem, uh, we must take into account the complex syntax of SQL, uh, which might uh, require a very long and intricate query in order to express a very simple natural language question. And the database structure, which might also be very complex and a very short and simple natural language question might uh, require a very complex SQL query. So as I said earlier, uh, the database community has tried to tackle this problem for many decades. Um, the first solutions were keyword systems that uh, only accepted very small natural language inputs that were keywords and not full uh, sentences. Uh, as time progressed, the systems got more complex and could be able to create queries with more complex functions. And uh, only a few uh, approaches that uh, can, you, can accept full natural language inputs exist from the database community. And all these solutions mostly rely on syntactic parsers, ontology mappings, knowledge bases, and these kind of techniques. But recently, uh, a new wave of research has started that uh, considers this problem a translation problem from natural language to SQL, and it uses deep learnings to create these translations. And in fact, in the last uh, seven years, we have seen uh, many different systems pop up, many different data sets, and the various systems to represent language for this exact problem. And uh, we will get into these uh, in a moment. But first of all, let's talk about the available benchmarks for this problem. So for a long time, uh, benchmarks has been uh, a pain point for this problem because early approaches did not use uh, the same data sets or they might have used very small data sets or proprietary data sets that could not be released to the public. And as a result, there could not be a fair comparison between different proposed systems. However, in 2017 and 18, two very large uh, benchmarks that contained tens of thousands of examples were released, and these benchmarks allowed us, uh, allowed a new wave of deep learning research, which we will be seeing today. But first, let's take a quick look into these two datasets. On one hand, we have the WikiSQL dataset, which is a large crowdsourced dataset uh, that was uh, crawled from Wikipedia, and the way it was created is that tables were extracted and the uh, questions and SQL queries were crowdsourced. So it is important here to note that uh, this data set does not contain full relational databases, but um, only single tables. And as a result, the SQL queries that can be posed on these tables are uh, rather simple. Additionally, because this data set was crowdsourced, it was not created uh, exclusively by experts, so it contains many mistakes. And in fact, the research has shown that human accuracy, even experts, can only score about 88% on this data set, which shows that it has uh, a lot of mistakes and ambiguities. In 2018, SPIDER was released, which is a large and complex data set for this problem. It contains uh, full relational databases and 10,000 different questions from 138 different domains. It was created by uh, experts on the database field. And as a result, uh, it has uh, much better quality. It has much better uh, queries. Uh, 
uh, more complex queries. And uh, at the moment, it is the go-to data set to train and to evaluate the text to SQL system. So as I said, there have been many proposed systems in the past years. So in order to better understand uh, the anatomy of such a system, we will first take a look uh, at the taxonomy of a text to SQL system, where we will be seeing uh, each part uh, that the system and each uh, step that is required in the text to SQL process. So uh, we start with a natural language question and a database on which the question is posed. The first step is schema linking, which is the process of discovering possible mentions uh, of database elements in the natural language question. And this allows us to get a better understanding of the question and help the system create better uh, SQL queries. Then we have the natural language processing step in which we want to create uh, efficient representations of the natural language that can be accepted by the neural network. Then we have the input encoding step. Since we have uh, inputs of different types, uh, we must find a way to encode it efficiently. And when we create a representation inside the network, we must also then consider how we're going to create an SQL query from this representation. And this is the output decoding step where we design the way that the SQL query will be predicted. And of course, since we're dealing with neural networks, we must also consider that the way that this network will have to be trained. And finally, we're going to discuss about some uh, techniques, some output refinement techniques that can be added to the system after it was trained so it can produce uh, SQL queries of better quality. So we start with the database and the natural language question, and the first step is schema linking. Uh, in order to better understand what schema linking is, we can imagine the way that a human expert would create an SQL query from a natural language question. So one of the first things that they would do is try to understand how the mentions in the natural language question uh, relate to the database elements. So in this example, we can see that uh, the word head is referring uh, to the table named head as well. And this shows us that this uh, is a table link to the table head. And we can also see that the number 56 in this question is referring to a column. Uh, it, actually, it's referring to a value that is stored under a column named age under the table uh, head. So this is a value link. So in essence, we differentiate three different types of schema links, which are table links, column links, and value links. So in schema linking, we have to consider three questions. Uh, which parts of the question we will consider? So these are our question candidates, our query candidates, sorry. Which parts of the database we will consider? So these are the database candidates. And how we are going to compare these two uh, parts and how we will decide if there is a match between them. So for query candidates, there are four ways uh, we can discover them. The first and simplest one is to uh, consider every single token of the NLQ. So we, uh, this is the simplest way where we take each uh, word separately. And uh, this cannot find many uh, query candidates. In this example, we can only find this uh, candidate, which is a single word. A more advanced technique is to consider n-grams, so essentially phrases of multiple words. Uh, so this technique can find the rest of the query candidates in these examples, but there are also more advanced techniques, for example, named entity recognition, uh, which can help us identify uh, mostly uh, value links. In this example, it can find the query candidate New York. Um, however, what if uh, New York is stored in the database in a different way. For example, it could be stored as NY instead of New York. Uh, to tackle this problem, we must also generate additional candidates based on the ones we have found. Um, so in this case, we can look up for similar values inside the database. 
So if we search for New York inside the database, we might uh, discover uh, that it is stored as NY, or if we search New York on an external knowledge base, we might find uh, different ways that it can be expressed. So in this way, we have found uh, the correct query candidate. Uh, when we want to find database candidates, uh, there are three sources that we must look into, uh, table and column names, which is rather easy since uh, their number would usually be not that large. And the third source is uh, values inside the database. And in this case, uh, we need to take a more careful approach because uh, the amount of data stored inside the database might be too large uh, to simply iterate through all of it. So one way is to consider uh, to find values by looking them up inside the database using uh, database structures such as inverted indices, which makes uh, searching the database faster. However, there is also a problem here. If we do not have access to the data stored inside the database, maybe due to privacy reasons, or maybe there's too much data and it's not efficient to simply search for it. Uh, here again, we can search for candidates uh, in external knowledge bases and knowledge graphs. So if we consider the previous example of New York, we could search New York in the knowledge graph named ConceptNet. And ConceptNet would inform us that New York is actually a state. And this would allow us to link New York to a column named born state under the table head. So now that we have both our query candidates and database candidates, uh, we must find a way to compare them and decide if there's a match between them. Uh, the simplest way to do this is to consider exact matches. So if the query candidate and the database candidate are identical, we have a match. Of course, uh, this is a very simple method and it will not find all schema links. Uh, we can also consider partial matches, which means that uh, some of the words between the two candidates match, but not all of them. Uh, we can also do fuzzy string matching, which means that uh, the candidates are written using a different uh, spelling or there's a spelling mistake, but all these methods will not be able to identify uh, synonyms or when uh, uh, the word is expressed differently uh, than the way it is stored in the database. To tackle this kind of problem, we must use more advanced matching methods. Uh, and these methods usually rely on natural language processing techniques using uh, learned embeddings or maybe uh, more advanced models and classifiers. So this uh, was the schema linking process. Now that we have our inputs and some additional information derived from the schema linking process, we must uh, find a way to create a representation for this natural language that can be accepted by the neural network. And the go-to technique to do this for a long time was using trained word embeddings and recurrent neural networks. So we could use uh, glove embeddings, for example, and LSTM networks. However, since the introduction of the transformer architecture and the introduction of pre-trained language models, uh, this is the best way to do this, and the, the best performance is usually uh, achieved using pre-trained language models, such as BERT and so on. And we make an additional distinction between these models, whether they are encoder only or they are encoder decoder. So this is a differentiation based on their architecture, and we will talk more about this in a moment. So let's see how we would go about uh, creating representations with word embeddings. So in this case, we have uh, a pre-trained set of word vectors, and each of the words in the input uh, is mapped to an embedding vector. Here we have the problem that some rare words, such as names or numbers, might not have uh, a vector in our uh, pre-trained vector set. And this is called the out of vocabulary problem where we do not have a representation. Nevertheless, our vectors would be given to a recurrent neural network such as, such as an LSTM. And this network would create uh, 
a set of representations for our inputs would th that would be then given to the rest of the system to process and to create an SQL query. Uh, two major drawbacks of RNNs are that first, uh, when sequences get longer, the cost of processing them rises very quickly. And additionally, recurrent neural networks have a hard time uh, making associations of words that appear very early in the sequence with words that appear very late in the sequence. So in this case, uh, it would be difficult to make the connection between the word nationality and the name of the player. If we wanted to use encoder-only pre-trained language models, uh, we could uh, essentially swap the RNN with a transformer-based PLM such as BERT. Uh, and we have a lot of advantages here. First of all, the, the embeddings that BERT uses, uh, word piece embeddings, can divide unknown words into known subwords. So in this case, uh, the name here would be divided into smaller tokens, which we have representations for. So this way we solve the out of vocabulary problem. And Additionally, due to the vast amounts of data that the pre-trained language models ha has seen during its pre-training, would uh, boost the performance of our system by a lot. Additionally, um, transformers are very good at finding connections between words, even if they're uh, not that close to each other in the input. And the cost of uh, processing uh, larger inputs does not uh, rise as fast as with RNNs. So this was encoder-only PLMs. We also have encoder-decoder PLMs, such as T5. In this case, uh, the PLM is a complete sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence framework. So uh, we would give us our inputs as a sequence, and it would uh, not just create representations. It will also create the input. Um, on one hand, this, these models are very powerful. On the other hand, uh, these models, uh, we cannot uh, play with their architecture since they're pre-trained with this architecture. It's no point in uh, changing their architecture. So we must work with them as they are. Additionally, we should mention that there are pre-trained language models that were designed specifically for this problem, such as Grappa and they give better performance to text-to-SQL systems because they were pre-trained specifically for such tasks. Uh, their difference is that they were pre-trained on data sets that are related to the text-to-SQL problem, and their pre-training tasks are also uh, closely related to our downstream task. So now that we have created representations for our inputs, uh, we will look into how we encode these inputs. So uh, the first systems used separate encoding for our inputs. So we would have uh, one encoder for the question and a different encoder for uh, the database. The main reason for this is that these inputs have a different shape, so it makes sense to encode them separately. Uh, and uh, at some point later on in the network, these two representations must be combined in some way, either with an attention mechanism, with summarization, uh, concatenation, uh, and so on. However, more recent models that rely on pre-trained language models use serialization for encoding their inputs. Uh, and the reason for this is that uh, these kinds of inputs are better uh, handled by pre-trained language models. Uh, in this case, our database and our natural language question will be uh, serialized uh, as a common sequence. Uh, so here, for example, we start with the natural language question, we have a separating token, and then we have the names of the tables and the names of the columns. Uh, a unique approach uh, proposed by a system called HydroNet is encoding uh, the natural language question with each column separately. Uh, this has only been used by this specific model, and it works very well uh, for the WikiSQL dataset that only has single tables and not full relational databases. Uh, so uh, we haven't seen a similar approach that can work on Spider, and probably uh, there won't be one since full relational databases have multiple tables, multiple columns, and it would take 
uh, too many iterations to process uh, each column separately. Finally, a more advanced technique is graph encoding. So in this case, uh, we represent the database schema as a graph where we have the columns, we have the tables, we have information about which column belongs to which table, uh, information about foreign keys that connect different tables. We can also add the words of the question as nodes in the graph. And we can also add extra information that was extracted with schema linking uh, to show connections between uh, parts of the question uh, with parts of the database. Of course, this uh, uh, requires a more intricate neural uh, design, but it is much more promising since it can uh, reserve all the information of the problem. So we have created an internal representation in the network. Now we must consider how we're going to make uh, SQL predictions uh, using this information. And we have three different types of decoders. First of all, we have sequence-based decoders. So these decoders generate the SQL query uh, token by token. Uh, this is a very simple and easy way to design a decoder. Uh, because we can use a, a lot of already available architectures. Uh, however, uh, the problem here is that the network must also learn to generate uh, the, the very complex SQL uh, syntax, um, which uh, allows a lot of possibilities for errors, because it is very easy for such a decoder to mess up the correct order of the clauses, or make syntactical errors or grammatical errors. And this was avoided until recently. However, uh, there have been new approaches that have uh, identified ways of preventing these kind of decoders from making these errors. Another type of decoder is a sketch-based decoder. Uh, in this case, we consider a predefined sketch of an SQL query that has different uh, parts of it missing. So in order to create the SQL query, we must find a way to fill these slots. So this further simplifies the problem because our network only has to make uh, single predictions about, for example, which aggregation function to use, which column to put in each slot and so on. Uh, but it is very hard to extend this kind of approach to more complex SQL queries or to SQL queries that work on full relational databases because it is difficult to design a sketch that would work like that. Finally, we have grammar-based decoders, uh, which on, also generate a sequence, but uh, here instead they generate a sequence of grammar rules. Um, and when these grammar rules are applied sequentially, we can construct uh, an SQL query. And these kind of decoders make it easier to avoid the errors. Since we're following a grammar, we cannot make grammatical mistakes. And they can cover more complex queries as well. Uh, however, they require uh, a more uh, complex design. Moving on, we should consider how we will train the network. There are four different ways. Uh, obviously, we can train the network from scratch, as, is, as it is common. Uh, we can also perform transfer learning, which essentially happens where we, when we're using a pre-trained language model because we are taking advantage of a pre-trained network and we're fine-tuning fine it further on our downstream task. There are also some additional objectives that uh, we can train our models uh, along with the text-to-SQL task. Um, and these objectives are usually closely related to the text to SQL ta task, but um, they can give some extra knowledge to the model about uh, its structure and some additional information on, on how to perform better on it. Finally, another uh, approach would be to pre-train specific parts uh, of the model. For example, uh, we could pre-train only the decoder before training the entire model. And in this way, maybe the decoder could learn, uh, could get a better idea of the structure of an SQL query or, or a better uh, general understanding of the problem before we train it, uh, uh, before we train the entire model. And finally, 
uh, we will talk about some output refinement techniques that can be added to the model after it's trained uh, in order to improve its performance or to avoid um, some mistakes that it would make without them. One such technique is the output refinement technique that's called execution guided decoding. Uh, this can be applied to any sketch based decoder. Uh, and we said that uh, sketch based decoders avoid a lot of errors because they're just uh, completing a predefined sketch. However, there are still some uh, errors that can be generated. For example, if we use an aggregation function such as max or mean on a string value, this is not going to run. So in order to tackle such problems, execution de guide, guided decoding uh, tries to uh, execute the SQL query as its slot is being filled. And if the system sees that a certain prediction leads to a query that cannot be executed or it uh, returns no results, it uh, considers that it should probably change this prediction because this is not going to lead to uh, a good prediction. Another output refinement technique is constraint decoding. This can be applied to sequence-based decoders. And what it does essentially is that uh, during its prediction step, it tries to find uh, predictions that would lead to a syntactically or grammatically incorrect query, and it would prevent the model from uh, making uh, such a prediction. And we will talk about uh, a technique uh, like this called Picard later on. Uh, finally, uh, we have discriminative re-ranking. And in this case, we can ask the model to predict more than one SQL queries. So we have an example here that we ask our model to make four predictions instead of one, but the, the correct prediction is ranked third in, by our model's confidence. Uh, what we do with discriminative re-ranking is we add an extra model that has to take these predictions and rank them uh, in the way that this model thinks uh, they're likely to be correct. So. In this example, we, our re-ranker might be able to understand that the third query is actually correct, and it would rank it first instead of third. So this uh, completes our taxonomy, and we can move on by looking at some uh, key uh, text-to-SQL systems. So first we have SQLNet. This was uh, one of the first models to be proposed. And this was actually the first sketch-based uh, model. So what it does is that it uses this sketch that we saw earlier, which has uh, a predefined amount of slots that need to be filled. And it uses six different networks. And each network is responsible for filling a different part of the, SQ of the query sketch. So it has a, a network that will predict the aggregation function. It has a network that will predict the column in the select clause, and so on. So uh, as we said earlier, due to this sketch-based decoder, it is very difficult to extend this model to a full relational database or to make it predict uh, more complex queries uh, that can be run on full relational databases. Uh, as far as it concerns its encoder, it uses separate encoding for the natural language question and the uh, column names of the table. Um, and then this representation that is uh, processed is given to each network separately, and each network makes a different prediction that when we uh, combine them, make our SQL query. Moving on, we have RAT SQL. Uh, this is a more advanced system that runs on the SPIDER dataset, so it can produce uh, complex SQL queries that run on full relational databases. Um, it uses graph encoding, so it starts by creating what it calls a contextualized schema graph. This contextualized schema graph contains the schema of the database, uh, which has every table and every column, uh, and they are connected with each other uh, with edges that show uh, the relations such as foreign keys, primary keys, which columns belong to which tables, and so on. And the 
NLQ, uh, the words of the natural language question are also added as word nodes in this graph. And it also performs schema linking. So some NLQ nodes can be connected to uh, database elements uh, with relations that show uh, what type of schema links there are between them. And then these nodes of the graph can be encoded either with GLOVE embeddings and LSTM networks or using the BERT pre-trained language model. And as we should expect, when we use BERT for this job, uh, our model achieves a better performance. Uh, and after it creates this representation using BERT, for example, it uses uh, a special uh, uh, model of uh, transformers, uh, which the authors call uh, relational, uh, relation aware transformers. And what these transformers do is they take not only uh, the, the graph nodes, but also the graph edges, which contain information about the relations between these nodes. So uh, they're encoded together to create better representations. And these representations are then given to uh, an LSTM decoder that predicts grammar rules. So here we have uh, a grammar-based decoder uh, that predicts a sequence of grammar rules. And when these grammar rules are applied in the way that they were predicted, uh, we will create an SQL query in the form of uh, an abstract uh, syntax tree. Finally, uh, we will see Picard. Picard is not a model by itself, but actually um, an output refinement technique that can be applied on uh, sequence-based autoregressive decoders. Uh, in, for example, Picard combined with the T5 model um, has one of the best performances on the SPIDER dataset. And what Picard does is it follows the decoder during its prediction step and it examines all the possible predictions that the model could make. And if it sees that, for example, uh, making this prediction would lead to an SQL query with an incorrect syntax, it prevents the model from making this prediction. Uh, here, for example, uh, Picard would identify that age is in fact a column name and not a table name and adding it to in the from clause would lead to uh, syntactical error or it can also detect that if the model tries to use um, a column name in the select clause from a table that is not mentioned in the from clause this will also lead to a query that returns an error, so it would uh, uh, prevent the model from making this prediction. So uh, a lot of work has been done on this problem. However, there's a lot of work to be done uh, as well, and there are a lot of challenges and research opportunities. And we will mention two big uh, areas where uh, improvements can be made. Uh, at least for the text to SQL problem. So first of all, uh, as I said earlier, SPIDER has long been uh, the go-to benchmark for training and for evaluating text to SQL uh, systems. And authors uh, don't usually perform any additional experiments on other benchmarks. However, uh, SPIDER is not perfect. Uh, first of all, it was uh, created specifically for this problem. So it has some bias introduced in it. For example, um, the database, databases that it contains are not as complex as a real world database would be. Um, they do not have uh, a lot of data stored in them. They do not have complex schemas. Uh, in fact, the entire benchmark is about two gigabytes, whereas one a uh, single database used in a real life application would uh, usually be much larger than two gigabytes. Um, additionally, it only has about 10,000 examples, which for a uh, deep learning system, uh, we could not say that it's a lot. And there is no fine grain categorization between different types of queries, uh, besides the easy, medium, hard, and extra hard categories. So it does not give us 
uh, a lot of insights about uh, what types of queries our models can answer, uh, where our model fails to predict the correct query, uh, and so on. So uh, additionally, uh, since systems nowadays can reach up to 80% on this benchmark, it's time that we set new standards and that we create uh, new data sets for this problem. Um, and we should aim to use real world databases taken from real life scenarios. We should uh, try to ask actual users of this database to provide us uh, with uh, NL queries and SQL queries so that we can test our systems on what uh, an actual user would ask. Additionally, we should aim to have better categorization, uh, for example, with synonyms, misspellings, missing info, and all these challenges we talked about earlier, so we can uh, better understand what our systems can do and what our systems cannot uh, yet do. Additionally, uh, we should look into the technical feasibility of text to SQL systems. Uh, we talked about a lot of techniques and a lot uh, of uh, interesting research uh, proposals. Um, however, these auth the authors of these uh, systems do not uh, usually uh, look into if these systems can be applied in a real life application. For example, uh, large pre-trained language models might improve performance a lot. However, they also need an expensive infrastructure and they take a lot of time uh, to make predictions. So uh, maybe, uh, probably, these are not ideal for a real world application. So there's a lot of room for technical contribution and making these, uh, uh, these systems uh, work in real life. There's a lot of room for optimizing all these techniques we talked about. And there's a lot of work for creating benchmarks that test the technical feasibility of these systems. Uh, so we should not only look into their accuracy or how many uh, SQL queries they predict correct, but we should also look into how big are these models are, uh, what type of computing requirements they have, and how much time they take uh, to make a prediction, because these are all uh, very important factors to consider when creating an application that uses a text to SQL system. So this concludes uh, the first part with about text to SQL uh, systems. We will now look into the reverse problem of SQL to text. So, as I said earlier, the SQL to text problem is essential for explaining a predicted SQL query to the user so that the user can verify uh, if this prediction is what they actually wanted. Um, however, besides their use in natural language interfaces, SQL to text systems can also be very useful for uh, automatically generating comments about SQL code written by uh, technical experts, and uh, they might write some code that they would upload in an online repository, and it would be very helpful to generate, uh, to quickly generate descriptions about their code. Uh, it's also useful for helping even technical users understand very large uh, SQL queries, and it is also very useful for data augmentation for the text to SQL problem where we could, for example, uh, generate many SQL queries using a predefined grammar and synthetically generate their natural language equivalents using an SQL to text uh, system. So let's look at these at the, at the challenges of the SQL to text problem, uh, starting again from the natural language side. Um, in this, this time, the generally generated natural language explanations must be fluent uh, and human-like uh, and not look like uh, something a robot would generate. They should uh, also avoid unnecessary repetitions and they should uh, avoid unnecessary uh, complications. So they should aim to be as fluent, human-like 
and simple and easy to understand uh, as possible. From the SQL side, uh, our system must be able to identify uh, the domain of the database and use the appropriate vocabulary. For example, uh, the SQL keyword max uh, will have different uh, translations depending on the context of the database and the column that it is used on. For example, the max lap time would be translated to the slowest lap time but the max price would be translated to the highest price. So it is uh, important for our system to identify uh, the correct vocabulary for each translation. Additionally, it should be able to capture uh, the semantics and the deeper meaning of SQL queries, uh, which sometimes might be very long and complex, and sometimes they might be short and simple, but they could have the same meaning uh, nonetheless if they are expressed on databases with different schemas. Uh, additionally, it should be able to identify which parts of the query should be translated and which parts do not need an explicit verbalization. For example, in this, in this SQL query, we have uh, multiple joins, uh, which do not need uh, to be verbalized directly. Instead, this query can uh, easily be explained as show project members from Italy. Uh, despite it uh, being so long. So now let's look into some uh, approaches and systems in the SQL to text field. Um, this is a problem that has seen relatively uh, little attention compared to the text to SQL problem. Um, here again, we have some earlier approaches that do not use uh, deep learning and we call them template-based approaches. We will see an example later on, but we will mostly focus on neural-based approaches that can also be uh, separated in two categories based on the architecture of these systems, whether they, are, uh, they have a sequence-to-sequence -sequence architecture or a graph-to-sequence architecture. Um, and as I said, there are not many approaches even uh, for deep learning systems, we only have a handful of approaches, um, but more systems are starting to appear lately uh, and they're mostly motivated by data augmentation efforts for the text to SQL problem. So let's have a quick look on template based approaches first, and then we will uh, move on to neural based approaches. So for uh, template-based approaches, usually the query is transformed into a query graph and we have a predefined set of templates for the given database and each node in the query graph uh, can be uh, replaced by a predefined template. And the query explanation is then created by traversing the query graph and using the appropriate templates to create a verbalization for each node in the graph. Uh, these kind of approaches can be very precise because uh, they will create a verbalization for every part of the query. Uh, however, if we want to move our system to a new database, we will have to create uh, a new set of templates for the new database, which requires uh, manual effort from an expert. And additionally, because we have to verbalize Every part of the query, uh, the, query the query explanations that are generated uh, might not be that fluent, realistic, and human-like. Now, let's see an example of a template-based uh, SQL to text system. Here, we have this input query. And the first thing that the system does is to represent this uh, query using a query graph. Uh, where we see each part of the query. Here we have the select clause, uh, the from and join clauses with the respective tables. And here we have the conditions from the where clause. So what the system would do here is it would start from the part of the graph that represents the select clause, and it would create a, a verbalization for this part of the graph. Then it would move to the part of the graph that contains the tables, 
and it would generate a natural language explanation for this part. And finally, it would move on to the last parts of the graph that contain the conditions and generate uh, a part for, for uh, this, uh, an explanation for this part of the graph, and then it would join these three explanations together to create the final uh, explanation of the SQL query. And as we see, it has correctly described the entire query. However, it could have been much uh, more human-like, much more fluent, and it could, could have uh, avoided some unnecessary verbalizations. So now let's move in. Let's move on to neural-based approaches. So neural-based approaches uh, can produce much more fluent and human-like explanations. Uh, they are easier to generalize to new and unseen databases, even without having to generate uh, new templates or we have, without having to train them uh, specifically on this new database. However, due to their nature and the nature of deep learning, um, we cannot always guarantee that the generated uh, explanation will be precise and correct. And as I said, we have two categories. Uh, we have sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, SQL-to-text systems, and we have graph-to-sequence systems. And uh, this depends on the way that they process uh, the SQL query, uh, either as a sequence or either uh, as a graph, uh, as we will see later on. However, every time the output is generated as a sequence, since we have natural language, uh, which cannot always uh, be represented uh, as a graph. And as I said, this is a relatively unexplored field. Um, it does not have its own data sets. It relies on the data sets uh, created for the text to SQL problem. And there are about a handful of approaches as we see in this table. And in fact, most of them uh, only work on the simpler WikiSQL data set. So let's start with sequence-to-sequence -sequence SQL to text systems. Um, in this case, the SQL query is uh, encoded as a text sequence, so we do not take into account its structure, its grammar, and so on. Uh, and we can use any uh, RNN encoder or transformer-based encoder for this job. And the NL explanation is also generated uh, as a sequence of text. Uh, again, we can use LSTMs, we can use uh, transformers. And uh, in this case, uh, we look at the problem as any other translation task, as we could uh, translate, for example, French to English, uh, and so on. Uh, a subcategory of sequence to sequence approaches is hierarchical sequence to sequence. Uh, in this case, we consider each clause of the SQL query separately, and we give each clause to a sequence-to-sequence -sequence network, and we generate explanations for each clause uh, separately, and these uh, explanations can then be combined to create an explanation uh, for the entire query. And as we see here, this approach also works, but uh, because it does not process the entire query at once, it tends to create uh, some repetitions and some uh, unnatural over verbalizations uh, that uh, an approach that could process the entire query at, at once could avoid. So moving on, we have graph to sequence systems. In this case, the SQL query is encoded uh, as a graph or as a tree. So we have to use uh, graph neural networks or graph transformers. Uh, here we can see an example of how an SQL query can be represented as a graph, uh, where each child of the root node uh, represents uh, a clause of the query, and then each uh, node representing a clause has uh, some child nodes that represent the columns, the tables, um, the operators and so on that appear in this clause. Uh, again, here the explanation is generated as a sequence and we can use 
uh, an RNN or a transformer based decoder for this job. And it is also interesting to notice here how this query graph is actually a bit different to the query graph that is used by template based approaches. And it might be interesting to investigate if these uh, approaches could work better or if we could combine the forces of different systems to uh, create something better. So, as I said, there are not a lot of uh, systems in this problem. However, there are a lot of opportunities for uh, new research in this field. Uh, first and foremost, uh, no system has ever used a pre-trained language model for this task. So, uh, it could be interesting to investigate how these uh, models would perform on this task. In fact, uh, recently we have seen models such as CodeBird, Code T5, and so on, uh, perform really well on code-related tasks, such as code generation, code translation, let's say from C++ to Python, and code summarization, which is essentially the task of describing a program in natural language, which is uh, exactly what we're looking for in SQL to text. So it would be, uh, it would be interesting to investigate how these models would perform on the SQL to text task. And uh, some things that we could investigate is, for example, which pre-training tasks uh, lead to better performance, uh, how we can uh, formulate our input uh, to make the model uh, uh, create better explanations, how, big, how bigger models perform better maybe, or if we can uh, train a smaller model to uh, to perform well on the SQL to text task, how we, how we tune the hyperparameters and so on. Um, another interesting opportunity is creating a metric for this problem, since currently there is no dedicated metric that works uh, specifically for this problem. Um, in fact, most works so far have relied on automated, automated translation metrics such as Bleu, Rouge, and uh, Meteor, uh, which might work well for other translation tasks. However, they're not as robust for uh, the query explanation problem. And as we see here in this table, a very small, uh, here in this table, we see how we have very small uh, pieces of text and even uh, a change in a single word can lead to an incorrect translation. However, because this prediction is using very similar vocabulary to the ground truth, uh, automatic translation metrics give this uh, verbalization very high scores. Uh, and instead, for uh, a prediction that uses completely different vocabulary, but is uh, semantically equivalent, so it says the exact same thing, uh, this automatic uh, translation metrics uh, uh, assign very low scores to this correct verbalization. So it is evident that we need a better metric for this problem. And uh, a question that arises is, can we do this using learned metrics? Uh, because essentially we want uh, a metric that can capture semantic uh, equality and semantic differences between uh, the candidate and the reference. So maybe neural models uh, or more specifically pre-trained language models could perform very well. And we have already seen uh, some such models being proposed such as BERT score or BLIRT that uh, perform very well for evaluating different types of tasks. Uh, maybe we could fine tune these models for our task as well, or maybe we can design something else uh, based on these models. Additionally, uh, all these metrics I talked about earlier do not take the SQL into account, which is a very important part of the problem. So maybe uh, it would be interesting to design a metric that also looks into the SQL query along with the candidates and the uh, reference to find a better score for this uh, prediction. Finally, uh, even though we have 
a lot of systems or we have some systems at least for this uh, problem we have not looked into uh, exactly what is a query explanation so a previous work has identified that uh, an explanation can be expressed with different uh, styles it can be expressed as a statement as a question or as a command uh, for example uh, we could ask uh, which employees uh, earn a monthly sal salary higher than 10,000 as a question or we could ask it as a command for example, show me all the employees with a monthly salary higher than 10,000. However, there are additional aspects uh, that we should consider uh, when we describe a query explanation. For example, uh, the level of detail. How detailed should a query explanation be? Uh, in this example, we see a query that uh, retrieves the name, the location, and the district uh, of uh, some shops in our database ordered by the number of products uh, in each shop. Uh, maybe we can have a user that doesn't care exactly uh, uh, what type of information is retrieved about each shop and they care more about their ordering. So uh, uh, a query explanation such as show me all shops ordered by their number of products is uh, sufficient for them. Or maybe we have a user that wants to find out exactly what the query does. So they would want an explanation uh, like the sec one, second one that uh, tells us exactly uh, all the attributes that are retrieved. So uh, we should ask ourselves which factors uh, determine the, the level of detail that we want in our query explanations. Uh, maybe it's a uh, preference of the user maybe it depends on the domain and the use case so for example uh, a database on medical research uh, might require a very detailed explanations of its queries uh, or maybe there are other aspects that uh, we should uh, think about and here we see some more examples uh, it is interesting to consider how the asterisk operator should be verbalized so essentially the asterisk operator retrieves all the columns that are stored uh, inside the tables in the from clause. Uh, but how should this operator be verbalized? Uh, for example, we could just use the name of the table, show me projects. Uh, maybe we should say, show me information or show me everything. Uh, again, since we're dealing with users that do not know exactly how the asterisk operator works, uh, we should uh, look into how we should be, it's best to verbalize this operator. Finally, as I said, there currently are no data sets uh, designed specifically for this problem. And all proposed systems are using uh, pre-existing text to SQL benchmarks in reverse order. Um, and this is also highly related to the lack of uh, a dedicated metric for this problem. So it would be very beneficial for research and especially uh, deep learning research to create a benchmark that uh, would allow uh, systems to be fairly uh, compared to one another. And uh, they should also uh, have a dedicated metric so that we can fairly compare their predictions. And such a benchmark should have maybe multiple explanations of SQL queries since there can be uh, different ways to express them with different styles, with different levels of detail, and so on. Uh, and it should also have uh, some interesting categories between different examples so that we can uh, better evaluate our systems and so that we can tell uh, in which examples, in which categories of examples our system works better and where our system is lacking and we should uh, focus uh, more. So this uh, sums up the first two parts of our tutorial. Uh, we will be having a coffee break for half an hour uh, and we will resume at half past 30. So welcome back from the break. Now we'll continue with uh, the next two parts, data to text, and then how we can bring together all the previous parts into one system. So first of all, let's talk about data to text. 
And what is data to text? A simple definition could be how could we translate information from a structured form to natural language? For example, we might have a Wikipedia info box, like here we have about Gauss, and we have some information in structs format, like when and where he was born and when he died. And we pass that information through a model and get back a nice verbalization with, uh, with text, in text. But there are some challenges that appear even from that really simple uh, example. Like, first of all, how can the model understand what the, the structure is? Like, we humans can immediately understand what born refers to, what died refers to, stuff like that. Also, some parts maybe could be om omitted. Like, for example, we feel like there is some redundancy uh, between the redundancy on the born uh, location, and we, we avoided some of the parts. How will we teach the model to avoid these parts too? And also, the generated text must be fluent. And, uh, but in, while it must be fluent, it must also remain faithful to the source, faithful to the truth. Okay, so first of all, why data to text? Why do we need data to text? One reason, maybe automatic creation of reports or articles. Like, for example, uh, we might have uh, statistics about an game, a basketball game, like an NBA basketball game. We pass that through a model and get back a nice ver uh, a verbalization that can be describing the outcome of the game, some important things that happened during the game. Or we might have data that are hard to understand. Like, for example, here there is a weather map and it has many symbols and many lines that it's not easy to understand. Personally, I cannot understand. But maybe if we pass that information through a model, the model could manage to explain them in natural text and understand that tomorrow expect strong southwest winds on the coast of South Korea, which is, might be useful. Okay, but we are talking about database democratization. So why is data to text important on that specific field? and specifically for a natural language interface. Let's see. We first, let's say on a natural language interface, we had text to SQL shown before, where we ask a query and it is translated to an SQL query. We then get back that SQL query and uh, return, it to, return it to text. So as the user can confirm, can confirm that the interpretation of the query was correct. And the user says, yeah, that is the correct interpretation. And then uh, normally you could get back a table like this. But we consider that having a data to text model pass getting that information of the query result, for example, could be much more user friendly, more nice to read, to understand, and also it is more chat based uh, appropriate. Another reason would be uh, to use data to text it would be to explain parts or the whole schema uh, of a database. Like for example, here we pass into a database that is about cars and stuff like that. And it would be really nice if we could get back an explanation of the content of the database. And this can be really useful, especially for people that are trying to find a specific database for their use case, a biologist, for example, who might uh, search for an animal, a database of animal species or a doctor who searches a database of drugs and their side effects and could really accelerate the process of finding the database that they search for. Okay, before we continue, we'll make a separation between the data to text, uh, between two data to text fields. Table to text, where we give as input a table and get back a verbalization. Graph to text, where we give as input a graph and get back a verbalization. Okay, so let's talk about the table to text problem. Again, a really simple definition. Given a table, generate text, natural language, that expresses the information included in the whole table or maybe parts of the table. I'm guessing pretty self-explanatory. Have an example here where we pass the table into the table, into the model and get back a nice verbalization. And there have been there has been a lot of work and a lot of data sets in uh, that uh, around the table to text. 
And they are pretty recent ones, if except the first one, which is from 2009. The rest of the data sets are pretty recent after 2016. The first ones were kind of domain specific, like for example, about Wikipedia biographies, restaurants, basketball games, stuff like that. After 2020, we see an appearance of more broader domain uh, data sets. And we have highlighted here some of the most influential data sets that boost research, which we will describe in a bit more detail. Wikibio. It has all the biography articles from the Wiki project along with their info box. Or in other words, uh, every famous person you know is Wikipedia info box. And the verbalization that was extracted from the Wikipedia text of that specific info box. The average info box length is around 26 words, which is pretty relatively small for today's models. And also the generated text is 53 words, again, fairly small. And generally speaking, it is an easy data set because there we have a lot of data, 700,000 700, info boxes, and they are really domain specific, really task specific, making the problem fairly easy to solve. On the other hand, we have the RotoWire dataset, which is a much more challenging dataset. In this dataset, we have NBA uh, basketball game statistics, um, which have a lot of records that uh, about how its player performed and how its team performed in general. And ideally, we would pass that model and get back the actual article that was written by a journalist, which focuses on the more interesting parts, most interesting parts of the statistics. But it is really challenging because there is a lot of information. We have on average 628 records for a single game. And also the generated text is pretty long with 800 words. And even today's models will, will struggle to generate such lengthy uh, reports. Also, we must mention that a newer version of RotoWire has been created and uh, sports uh, set basketball, that it's kind of the same, but fixes a leak between the train set and the test set. And now Toto, which is one of the most influential data sets and newer, and one of the newest ones. Given a Wikipedia table and a set of highlighted cells, we, can, we produce a one sentence description. Here, for example, we have a Wikipedia table about Gabriel Becker and some highlighted cells, and below we have the verbalization that describes only the information shown on these highlighted cells, not the whole table. And Toto has really three big qualities. First of all, it is big, having 135,000 data points. It is diverse, it spans many domains like sports, uh, countries, entertainment, movies, stuff like that. And also, it is of really high quality. And the question appears, how do you manage to create a big, diverse and of high quality data set. So let's see how they did it. They first crawled a table from Wikipedia. Pretty simple, pretty simple to do and you don't, it can be done automatically. Then they found text that overlaps with the, uh, with the uh, contents of the table. Like for example, here we can see that Django and 2012 overlap with the values in the table also done automatically. But now the next of the steps are done by humans. First one, highlight corresponding cells that appear in the sentence, also highlight them in the table. Like for example, here Django at 2012. Step number four is to remove parts that could not be inferred by the information that we have in the table. For example, after 2010 means nothing. Uh, for that specific table, we have no idea what was happening before 2010 and why 2010 is important. So we remove it. And also we make the sentence independent. He directed Django in 2012, we do not know who he is, or more specifically, the model will have no chance of knowing who uh, he is. And so we make the sentence independent by replacing him with Quentin Tarantino. And this is our final high quality uh, verbalization. And this is how they created the whole data set. <laughs> okay. Now, before we continue, we should talk a bit about the challenges of the table to text systems. We have a pretty simple example on the right. Given a table, we transform it into a JSON format and get back a verbalization. 
But first of all, how will we represent a table? For example, here we can see that we have an image. Oh, here we have just an image, a screenshot of a table. We humans immediately understand it, but of course, a machine must read it somehow. And some simple ideas appear, like for example, uh, since we are talking about tables, may, might a CSV format might be okay, maybe a JSON format, we will see later. Table understanding. The model must somehow understand that there are correlations between, for example, values and uh, column names and values, or column names with each other or value names with each other. Content selection. We might not need all the parts of the table for our verbalization. So, for example, we might care about the table title, but we don't care about the ID for some reason for our specific uh, task. Content planning. Okay. We have what we want to verbalize. We have selected what we want to verbalize. In what order should we verbalize it so that it looks more human-like? And finally, we have everything. We have we know how to understand tables. The model knows how to understand tables. What it should verbalize in what order? Now, how do we generate the words? How do we generate text? And there are also other challenges uh, like uh, language processing and neural training that were mentioned previously uh, by George. So we'll not get uh, into more detail. Okay. So first of all, how do we represent a table? And of course, a representation of a table depends on the data set that we are dealing with. So we'll first talk about Wikibio. Again, on the left, we have the information included in the info box. Like, for example, the name was George Mikkel, birth name Jurgis Mikkelaitis, and stuff like that. And we first take its value and separate it into separate words. So you have George, Mikkel, two different tokens. And now we create the bending, let's say, for George, for the first uh, word. We first add the field name. So George refers to a name. And then we add a positional uh, encoding that has two values. And uh, using that position encoding, the model will understand, first of all, the order of the values, because here we have um, we have George Mikkel. So we know that uh, one refers to the first word uh, of our token. So we have George Mikkel and one says this George is the first uh, token of the name. And also the two uh, refers to the position of the token starting from the end. So we need, the model will need that so that knows when it reaches at the end of the value to know that maybe we should start verbalizing the next value or maybe we should add some connector words. And we, we take that and we have for the word George, the field embedding name one, uh, two. And we have to do that, of course, for every word uh, in the info box. So for George, then for Mikkel, which is name two comma one, and uh, the rest, as we can see. But we have to say that newer models like table GPT uh, don't have that requirement on table GPT that we will see later, uh, it's okay to just pass uh, the column names and column values as they are without any explicit uh, encodings like the stuff above. Then about the NBA game uh, basketball statistics. We have a lot of records, a lot of information. So we, uh, we will describe how to, can we embed the number, let's say, for example, 23. This is a process that will have to be followed for every value included in the zone in the table. So for example, each record will consist of the type, points in our case, since 23 refers to points, the entity, Isaiah Thomas in that case, we can see it on the left, the value itself, which is 23, and if it was a visitor or home, if uh, he was a player of a visitor or the home team. And we create for that specific number, for 23 and only 23, that embedding. And we have to do that for every single piece of information. While that way we do not lose any original information since we encode everything with that simple embedding. Uh, 
but it will easily reach uh, the uh, token limits of PLMs, of language models, and uh, uh, we maybe somehow must do limit the amount of information that we will pass to these models. Then we have the Toto, uh, Toto data set. In the Toto data set, uh, you have the Wikipedia table on the left, in on which you highlight, uh, we only have here the highlighted portions of the table. And one way to represent it is through an XML-like uh, representation that follows XML rules, let's say. So for example, for we have page title Christian Stuani, which is the title of the table, then closing page title, and etc. And as you can see, each value is encoded explicitly. So at any given time, we know what its value refers to, like two refers to a cell value, or a number refers to a column name. But of course, it is really verbose. And as a result, and we also, the model that we use next, will have to somehow understand that XML type of representation also. The other way is through column value total representation, where we just pick the column name, followed by the value, then another column name, followed by its value, which is really concise. The model not, does not have to understand any new language uh, like the XML uh, type, but it has a lot of uh, implicit information. In other words, here, for example, the model will not, will not know what, when the column name stops and when the value starts. Uh, we know that because I have color coded, but the model will not have access to that color coding and the architecture itself must take that into account. Okay. Then we have table understanding. How will the model understand correlations? Like for example, uh, between ID and 12. A really simple and uh, kind of old approach would be to have, um, let's say that we have a column named director and the value Tarantino. We pass each one through an embedding layer and get back a representation. We concatenate that representation, uh, these two representations we pass that through an MLP encoder and get back a final number, a final embedding that represents the whole record. The MLP encoder and the embeddings, if need so, are trained end-to-end. -end. So we get, they get back the final verbalization of the model, we calculate the loss, and then we, the, through back propagation, we calculate the gradients and expect that uh, the um, useful information would have reached the encoder and the embeddings. It's a simple approach, meaning that it's kind of easy to understand and implement, but and it is flexible. If something changes in an input structure, we have column value. If something other is added for our specific use case, then we just have to change that part of the architecture and the rest of the architecture will not, will not have to know anything uh, that a change has happened. But of course, it is gradient vanishing prone. What do we mean by that? As I mentioned earlier, the gradients uh, are passed through the whole model, and this is the first component of the model. And it's really probable that not useful information, uh, not a lot of useful information will reach this, uh, the MLP encoder and the bendings. And also it is column value only. We uh, encode the information and the correlation between a column and this value, and we do not care about the other column values that might be included that appear in the table. Okay, another way of uh, doing table uh, understanding is through an auxiliary task named table reconstruction. Let's see the example. We have a, we have a table named James BT, full name, James Scott, for some reason, and uh, we tokenize it and we pass it through a model, like for example, you have name, then James, then bit, etc. And we pass it through a model. Then we get the embeddings of the encoder or maybe the values of the last layer if we don't have an encoder, it's a decoder only architecture. And we pass these embeddings that correspond to each input value through another network, a predictor network that has to predict, first of all, if the embedding 
belongs to a column name, and if it doesn't be, if it doesn't belong to the column name, then from which column it came from? So, for example, James came from the word name, and this is what the predictor network on the top must predict. And we calculate the loss of that. Uh, we calculate the loss, and we add it to our normal loss of the language model. And it has some uh, advantages. Again, we encode the column value relations because we ask that the embedding of James, for example, to include information that it came from name. But it also has some position encoding. Uh, it forces the model to understand uh, meaning behind the position. Why? And we can see that on the example, actually, because the first James must be, uh, be predicted from the network that it belongs to the column name, while the second James must be predicted that it belongs to the column full name. And also, it is PLM compatible. Actually, it doesn't care about the model below. We can consider the model as a black box. And uh, that way, this auxiliary task is compatible with any architecture. OK. Another thing is how can we understand numbers and their meaning, especially for some data sets like the NBA basketball game statistics data sets, RotoWire. Understanding number is really important because in the data sets, we can only see numbers, mostly at least. And the meaning of a number depends on two things. First of all, the context. If a play, only one player scored more than 30 points in the data set, then that is a really good performance. But if all players somehow, or in a different sport probably, scored more than 30 points, then it is average. Also, it depends on the type. If someone scored uh, five assists, then that is a good performance. But if someone scored five points, then it's a not so good performance. It's an average performance. Okay, so how can we encode that information? First of all, we define a different model for every type of uh, statistic, like a different model for points, a different uh, model for assists, and stuff like that. Especially, uh, specifically, we have a transformer, a transformer encoder. So we give into it some values of real, uh, some real point values, like for example, 32, 6, and 25, that we get from our data set, and we get back some embeddings. And these embeddings do not make any visual sense uh, right now, but we also pass each embedding through a full uh, through a one layer network followed by a sigmoid function and now we train the transformer to uh, create representations that if we give a high number for example 32 the representation will be much bigger the sigmoid function will be much bigger than giving 25 which be in turn must be will be much much bigger than 6 this is how uh, we train the transformer and does that work or has any meaning? Here, the authors have so, so the, uh, the embeddings if we didn't have any numerical encoding. These are numbers starting from 0 to 30 for the points. And uh, as we can see, in the latent space, there is a cluster of uh, points that we can name as uh, numbers, but not a specific ordering or something. But if we actually have numerical representation, two things appear. First of all, the numbers are distinct. And secondly, and most importantly, the numbers are ordered. Like they start from 0, 1, 2, 3, and reach uh, some value. And that is really important. Then it shows that in the latent space, now our model has understood the differences between big numbers and low numbers. And they're actually meaning depending on the type. Okay, now calling selection, which part of the table we should actually verbalize and which should we ignore? Uh, solution number one, one uh, early solution was through dual attention. And let's say that we have the table on the top right, named Quentin Tarantino, job director, born 1963. We have two encoders, one encodes the uh, the content of the table, Quentin Tarantino, director, 1963, 
and we get back a representation of it for each one of the values. The other one uh, encodes uh, column names like name, name, job, born. And we also have a decoder. And the decoder, so which generates the text. And at our specific time step, we have generated the phrase Quentin Tarantino is a, and we want to predict the next word. Okay. So uh, we calculate, first of all, the word level attention. The word level attention says in which token should we focus more? Of course, it makes sense that we focus more on the token director. We also calculate the, the field level attention, which again says, yeah, you should focus on the word job. We sum them up and we get that, yeah, yes, you should focus on the column, on the column value pair uh, job director. But one question is, why do we need both attentions? Why do we only, for example, keep the value, the content uh, attention, the word level attention? And we will see that through an example. Let's say that we have the table name Mike Sidas, birthplace Greece, nationality Greece. For some reason, it was written like that. And uh, so far, we have generated the word Mike while being generated the attention, the word level attention focused more on the word Mike. Then on Xidas, then it focused on the value Xidas. Okay, that is pretty easy to understand. On is, uh, let's say it focused on Xidas more, as I can see. But on Greek, it focused on the first Greece. Note that the model does not have access to the columns, to the column names above name, birthplace, nationality. So it just says Greece and Greece. It doesn't know how to differentiate between them. But by having field level attention for the last word Greek, the model will of course focus on, will attend more on nationality, not on birthplace. And when we sum them up together, the final uh, picked uh, column value pair would be nationality Greece and not birthplace Greece. Increasing the chances of having as verbalization Mike Sidas is Greek and not Mike Sidas is Greece. Okay, another way through an auxiliary task is through target prediction. We have a table and we have the target that was written by human when Tarantino is a director. We extract which records appeared in the verbalization and as a consequence, which did not. For example, here, for some reason, we didn't want AIDS to appear. And then we have a tra the transformer architecture with, that has a transformer encoder and a transformer decoder. The encoder will get into the column value uh, information. We'll create some representations, some embeddings. Then these embeddings will be given to the decoder along with uh, cross attention. And we get back that verbalization. That is the simple, uh, the transformer, what transformer does. We have not added anything new yet. What we add is an extra prediction layer that will predict if a representation of a value should be included. For example, ideally, in our case, it should be predicted that the first and second tokens, name and job, should be outputted, while the third one, age 59, shouldn't. And we train the, the encoder alternating with the decoder law. So for some steps, we train uh, for that uh, prediction task, for target prediction, and the other steps we train for the normal uh, text uh, generation task. Okay. The next challenge is content planning. In what order should we uh, verbalize the selected content? And again, we have an auxiliary task, the record ordering reward where we optimize the model based on the record of the produced, uh, the record order of the produced plan. What do we mean by that? Let's say that the human written verbalization is James Cameron, direct Davatar star Kate Winslet. If we extract the entities, we get that first James Cameron appeared, then Avatar, then Kate Winslet. But let's say that our table to text model created the verbalization that had uh, James Cameron first, then Kate Winslet, then Avatar. Okay, we can see that wasn't perfect. So we calculate the normalized Damerau-Levenstein distance 
by normalized means that it goes from zero to one, with one being no uh, changes have to be made. And uh, we get back a number. And then we task, we force our model to maximize that value, in this case, 0 0.66. And how uh, do we manage to maximize it? Well, since Levenstein distance is not differentiable, we cannot use uh, the loss. We cannot say that we added that to the loss, but instead we have to use reinforcement learning. And then we have the linear chain CRFs, which are the linear chain, uh, the linear chain conditional random fields. This is a module that is trained to maximize the probability of a specific plan appearing, like in this case, 3, 1, 2, null, given the encodings that we have from the table, let's say. Okay, and how can we train that module? Well, we can because we actually have the true plans from the training set. And uh, also we note that the null indicator allows for the model to also perform some kind of con selection, which says that they do not include, for example, in this, in this example, budget in the final verbalization. And how do we train it? Well, since the CRS, how do we use it during inference actually? Well, since the model was, uh, uh, is trained to maximize the likelihood, then we just give in the encodings of our table and we hope that the, the, the final plan returned will, will maximize the plan, will be a good plan. Okay, so now we have everything. We have understanding, selection, plan, how do we generate words? One solution, LSTM and attention. And we have to say that the task, the generation of uh, table uh, of text in table to text is not as simple as text to text uh, problems since we also require info about the plan that has been created. We need information about previous words. Okay, this is also true for text to text problems. But we also need general content of the table. It's different if we verb verbalize a table about students than table about employees, while there might be some common words. And how do they do that? Well, this is a plan encoder. We do not actually care about the specifics other than it uh, recursively encodes its part of the table, let's say. And then we say that the final state of the encoder uh, final state of the encoder will be the input to the decoder that generates text. Why do we do that? We assume that the final state of the encoder will include the general context information about the table. Then we also calculate the plan attention for the next time step, which, uh, which uh, record should we focus more on? And in this case, we focus for some reason for, on the first. Uh, record. And using the final state of the decoder and the attention, we uh, uh, calculate uh, the softmax over our vocabulary. In other words, we get a distribution over our vocabulary and we pick the most probable word. But the problem appears. But first of all, it's really good because it's interpretable, in uh, meaning that we can explore the plan attention and see, okay, something is going good, something is going bad. But it has, of course, the problem of vocabulary limitation. And more specifically, there are a lot of words that have low chance of appearing in our, uh, in our vocabulary. Our vocabulary is finite, let's say 20,000 words. But our tables have many words that have lower frequency of appearing, many unique words. And how can we solve that? Well, the information exists, actually. It's just not into our vocabulary, it's into our table. So somehow the model must know how to copy things from the table. And we do that through this, let's say, formula. The G part is a neural network that estimates uh, if we should copy or not copy, with one being, if it outputs one, then it's, def it's sure, certain that we must copy a word from our table. While if it is uh, a zero, then we are certain that we shouldn't copy and we should generate a word from our vocabulary. Okay, let's say that the model decided to copy. Then we must also define which part of the, what part of the table should we copy? 
And then to do that, we see into the attention. If the attention focuses on a specific part of the table, then probably that is the part of the table that we want to copy. On the other hand, if we don't want to copy, we will just generate, pick the word that had the highest probability in our vocabulary. And we sum these probabilities up because there might be common words between the table and the vocabulary, and we get the one that has the highest probability. And now we saw all these challenges, um, but there is another solution, which is the end-to-end -end approach, meaning that we only use need somehow to represent the table, and the rest can be done without us explicitly defining modules to do them. What do we mean about that? Let's say that we have a table. This is from the total example. And we pass it as, uh, and we first serialize it into a text format. Let's say we use the XML-like format. Then we pass that into a PLM, a pre-trained language model like T5 or BART, and get back the verbalization, and we train the model to create good verbalization. And that is all pretty much. <clears throat> Because these PLMs like T5 or BART are really powerful, especially in understanding text. And they are simple. The architecture is not that difficult to understand. And also implementing and use them is pretty easy because there's a huge uh, community around them. Um, there's a huge community around them. But they are hard to modify. You cannot actually change the architecture, architecture because if you change the architecture, then the values and the encodings will have no meaning for the model that was pre-trained on different uh, data set. And also it is computationally expensive. Both for fine-tuning and serving, we're talking about big models here, like uh, D5, 3 billion and uh, stuff like that, which need a lot of memory and uh, good CPUs or GPUs. Okay. We saw some challenges. Now let's see. Let's briefly see some of uh, the key systems that push the research forward. The NCP or neural content planning. This might seem a bit daunting at first, but we will take it step by step. We first have the record encoder, the record encoder, where we take the records and create embeddings for each one of them. We have the content selection planner, a separate module that will select which parts and in which order should they be verbalized. A plan encoder that gets the plan and actually encodes it so as the decoder above can understand it and follow it in order to create the to generate text. And having modu a modularized architecture like that allow has a good benefit of easier debugging and understanding. Something goes good with plan encoding, but the text generated is bad, then there is a problem probably in the text decoder. And in that specific uh, work, they, use, they created their own embeddings from scratch, which is useful if you are dealing with a data set such as the RotoWire one, which is really domain specific, the one that had basketball game statistics. Then we have data trans or data to text uh, transformer. Which it is the transformer architecture we give in the records, and then we pass that the embeddings through the decoder and get back a softmax over the to uh, find the words that we should pick for our verbalization. And we also have the, that, the target uh, prediction task we mentioned before, the target prediction auxiliary task. They also they use that uh, model on the RotoWire dataset again, on the NBA statistics, and they augment the RotoWire dataset by changing record values. Uh, but being careful to not uh, change the outcome of the game. And they also train the model again from scratch. Again, this is a good, uh, good option if you are dealing with really domain-specific data sets. And then we have table GPT. And to understand that model, we will see uh, what they do through the loss, through their loss function. And their loss function consists of three different parts. First of all, the language model loss. This is the expected loss that uh, any fine-tuning task using, for example, uh, using GPT would use. Like, for example, we pass in name James BT and we train the model to return something like the name is James BT. Nice. Then we have the structure reconstruction loss, 
where we force the name to create embeddings or encodings, or actually since it's a decoder only uh, architecture, the values at the end, to include information about the, uh, from which column name its value originated from. Like James comes from the uh, column name, name. And finally, content ordering loss, where we train the model to auxiliary, an auxiliary task that trains the model to uh, generate text in the correct order. And they don't do it using the Levens type distance. Instead, they pick the optimal transport distance. And they do that because optimal transport is differentiable, allowing for the usage of backpropagation and uh, and don't have the requirement to use reinforcement learning. And the model performs really great, especially on a few short settings. Like if we have a small number of 50 to 500 training prompts, which is fairly small, especially 50, then the model will perform really good. And finally, we have plan then generate, where starting from the bottom left, we have a table, we uh, serialize it, into year 2016, name and stuff like that. We pass it through a code encoder. In this case, this is BERT. And we take these encodings and we pass them to the ordering predictor. This is a CRF layer, the, like the one that we mentioned previously. And we get back a sequence of how its record should be verbalized. In what order should we verbalize? A plan, first name, then role, then year, then title. Then we pass that plan into our uh, sequence generator. And uh, of course, we also uh, pass the table itself. For example, here, then a uh, sequence generator might be a T5 or BART. In their case, they use BART. And they also teach the model to use the plan through reinforcement learning, because otherwise the model would just ignore it or it would be really hard to understand the meaning of just adding the tokens in front, name, role, year, title, to what they actually mean, and that the fact that they, this is actually the plan. Okay, let's now briefly explain the graph to text problem. And uh, by graph to text, for example, here we mean given a graph, in this case, a schema of a database, pass that through a model and get a back a description of the contents of the database or uh, or anything else that can be defined as a graph. And there have been, again, a lot of data sets and a lot of work has been done lately, a lot of recent ones. The domain here is broader because there were the graphs that exist, that existed and that were used were from broad domains. And we'll just see some influential uh, data sets next that we have highlighted. The web NLG dataset, it comprises of triplets found in DBpedia along with uh, verbalization written by humans. For example, Elliot CU, Alma Mater, University of Texas at Austin. And this uh, is uh, passed into a model and we get back this really nice verbalization on the right. It is fairly big with 17,000 triplets verbalized uh, and it consists of many domains from actually entities or family or word families in this uh, in DBpedia, like airport, uh, astronauts, movies, uh, companies, stuff like that. And it is still getting updated as far as we're concerned around uh, every three years. The next one is LDC, uh, where which is a data set that facilitates the abstract meaning representation task. What does that mean? It's a, a, this task tries to capture who did the, what to whom in a sentence. Uh, for example, we have here a graph, if he flies, he could go to the moon. And this is the graph that represents it. It's not that easy to actually create that graph. And it was created by human experts uh, that were given a sentence and managed to generate uh, that specific graph. The data sources that they get these sentences was from forum discussions, journals, blogs, and news texts. And again, it's still getting updated every three years. The next one, Map2Sec, is a really nice one. 
were given a route as a, let's say that on your map application you go from, want to go from point A to point B, then uh, you represent the whole route as a graph and not only the nodes of, uh, are in, on the road, but also you have nodes that are person, uh, not persons, uh, interesting points along the route. So for example, instead of having the application saying move 200 meters east, then you can have an application that says move until you find that light traffic and on your right, there is that uh, donut shop and on walk straight until you find the park on your left, that park on your left. And it is a fairly big data set of uh, 7,000 navigation instructions because uh, it's complexity. And all of the instructions were normally validated for their correctness by humans again. Okay, so this, uh, we have again some challenges. But the one challenge that we will focus is the graph understanding one, because most of the rest of the challenges, their solutions are kind of similar to the table to text uh, case, and they just require some slight modifications. So what do we mean by graph understanding? Well, there are some things that we must get from a graph, like somehow we must, the model must know how can we encode an edge between node one and n three, the fact that these two nodes are connected? Or how can we encode the fact that we can go to n four, to node four, and we can do it from n one, and we can do it using node two? Or how could we encode the directionality of uh, node three and node four? While there is no bidirectionality, for example, between node one and node two. And all these challenges, if we, if we manage to solve this challenge of graph encoding, then we can elevate the problem into data to text and be able to use table to text solutions also. And one way to do that is by, encode, uh, by enhancing the self-attention, actually the encoder of the transformer architecture. Here we have the equation of the transformer architecture and we have a graph node that goes from node one to node two using edge one. We take the embeddings of node one and node two and we stack them. We have to ignore the edge because it cannot be included easily in the equation. And uh, we calculate, we do the calculations of the encoder transformer and get back embeddings for each node. But of course, there's a problem. I, I just said that we completely ignored the edge and we must somehow incorporate the information that is uh, shown by using the, uh, the, the information that node one and node two are connected using edge one. And this is the same equation. Well, I've just done some quick simplifications. And the idea is to introduce an R multiplied by a weight matrix inside the self-attention and outside by a weight matrix F. The hopes are that uh, in hoping that the node, uh, the R multiplied by WR will show how much the node care with each other, like self-attention, for example. And the R outside will say how these two nodes care for each other. Okay, they somehow these two nodes are connected. How are they connected? This is shown by the outside part of the equation. But I just introduced the parameter R which must, must somehow be defined. The weights, okay, they are trained. They, they will be calculated. But how can we give R to the model? Let's say that we have a graph that consists of four nodes, the one that we had previously. We find all the combinations from going, from going from uh, uh, between two nodes, like from N1, how can I go to N1, N2, N3, N4, if a path exists? And we'll find only the shortest paths if more than one path uh, exists. And then we give that uh, we give that shortest path. Now, specifically, let's say for node one and n four, the shortest path is e one and uh, e three. If there are more than uh, one paths, we randomly pick one. And then we encode. We pass them through an encoder, and we sum up the encodings 
uh, and get back an embedding. Or we might not sum them up, we might average them, we might use a one dimensional convolution, we might use an RNN or anything. And we do that for every pair of uh, combination, every combination from node one to node one, and we get back uh, the matrix R, which is the one that we inserted in our uh, equation previously, in our uh, encode, transformer encoder equation. And also, there is again the end to end approach. Similarly, as in table to text, get a graph, somehow serialize it into text, pass that serialization through a pre trained language model like the five or BART, get back the target verbalization, train the model to uh, verbalize actually the text that are in the training set. And there is an assumption here. The assumption is that the model will be, if left alone, will be able to catch uh, relationships that exist between nodes. And the question is, can we help the model better understand what the graph is? The answer is yes. And we can do that through pre-training tasks. In other words, pre-train a bit more the already pre-trained uh, language models. And one task is node intense denoising, where we mask parts of the graph, like the nodes and uh, some edges, and then ask from the model to give back uh, the original graph, or delete parts of the graph, delete subgraphs, and ask again from the model to return back the whole uh, graph. And we'll just show some uh, key systems of graph text. Of course, this list is not exhaustive. These are just some representative ones. And for, for example, in graph transformer, you have the graph encoder that uses this enhanced self-attention mechanism that we mentioned before, specifically here to embed to encode the paths they use uh, the GRU, which is a RNN, a recurrent neural network. And given the encodings, they give them to uh, they pass them to the decoder of the transformer architecture, but they also, since we also need some global context about the graph, what this graph talks about in general, they introduce a new uh, a virtual node, a fake node into the graph that's co directly connected to all the other nodes in hopes that this node will have, uh, hoping that uh, this node will have uh, information about the whole graph. And they also use the copy mechanism as we saw before, uh, slightly modified for the graph text task. In the AMR, AMR BART, they use these pre-training tasks we mentioned before, the node that ends denoising and subgraph uh, denoising. But they also pre-train the already pre-trained models using the non uh, uh, the unified framework as they defined. If they didn't use that, then pre-training would look like that. We pass into a graph that has some masks, and then return the graph uh, field, the original graph back. In unified pre-training, you also put in, uh, in the input the actual the verbalization of the graph, also masked, and you all concatenated by the masked uh, graph also, and give back, ask for the model to return back uh, the original both text and graph. And by having a unified framework, the model will have better understanding of the correlations that exist between text and uh, and the AMR representation or the graph in general, if we are not in the abstract meaning representation uh, case. So, okay, you have some models. The question now is how can you evaluate them? We have data to text, so we have as output text, and our evaluation should somehow have, uh, our metrics should be good, have a high number if two texts are similar are in meaning, and be low if two texts are uh, not similar in meaning, makes sense. And there are a lot of options. Some uh, heuristic options like that are table specific, table text specific, and grammatic options like ble, meter and stuff like that, and semantic uh, options that uh, George previously mentioned uh, briefly. And I will just uh, point out parent, which is an interesting one. It's a table text specific one metric, where it 
The use is black, but it also takes account that we are trying to evaluate a system that takes as input tables, that, that wants to verbalize tables. And what it does is that if our goal verbalization has parts of information that are not in the info box in this case, then we shouldn't punch the model because it had no chances of actually um, verbalizing that piece of information. On the other hand, if the model verbalizes, uh, adds extra information that are not in the gold verbalization written by a human, but can be found in the table, then again, maybe we shouldn't punch that, uh, the model so hard because it didn't say something. It said something that uh, is true and can be found in the table. So it doesn't punch the model unfairly, is interpretable because it's comp it is based on Blair, as we said. So if we watch on the values of its component, then we can understand what's happening. But of course, it fails to understand semantic similarities, since again, it's based on Blair, and it is an engram, which in turn is an engram matching evaluation metric. And some results. And starting from the top for table to text, and specifically on the RotoWire dataset, you can see that the BLE scores achieved are pretty low. It goes from zero to 100, with 100 being uh, uh, the original text is same. The generated text is exactly the same as the one that we wanted, the one that was written by the journalists in the RotoWire case. And it is expected that the performance is not that high. Uh, because it's a really challenging data set. Also, uh, for Toto, we can see that simple application of T5 kind of uh, matches in uh, performance, more, most in, uh, more intricate architectures like plan then generate, which also uses BERT and BART inside of it. It also uses PLMs. But for graph to text, first of all, we can see that using T5 greatly increases performance for not having a pre-trained language model, like in Graph Transformer. But uh, the really interesting thing is that pre-training in like in AMR BART really increased performance by five BLE points, which is a significant amount of per, uh, performance improvement using only pre-training tasks. And there are some challenges and research, research opportunities in data to text, of course. First of all, the purpose might not always be clear when we are verbalizing a table. For example, we have a, a table of laptop models. Well, there might be uh, uh, many good uh, verbalizations or many verbalizations that should be considered valid because maybe verbalizing each row separately would lead to a length verbalization that is not useful for someone. But all of them could maybe could be considered valid. The thing is, though, on natural language interfaces, the user has asked a query. For example, how good is the cheapest laptop? And that query gives purpose to our answer. So for example, here, the second one, laptop two is the cheapest laptop with a fast CPU, but the smallest display is the correct verbalization to be picked. Then what about the opposite? Given text, uh, given some text, get uh, back, Structured, uh, uh, structured output, like we extract information uh, from, uh, we extract uh, the table or a graph or something from a text passage. And this can be uh, really useful. It goes into information the information retrieval field, but it can be really useful to have suddenly having from a continuous passage text, get back uh, a table that can be parsed and analyzed by a machine. Then we could utilize or create uh, data to text pre trained language models, our own pre trained language model. For example, so far, solutions use T5, they use BART, uh, which were created for text to text problems originally. Maybe we could, we could create uh, such a model specific for data to text, maybe table to text, a model that understands tables or a model that understands graphs. And there are some requirements. First of all, we might we need an appropriate architecture. We might not use the architecture from T5 or BART as is. We need a lot of data for pre-training, and we have access to a lot of data for table understanding through WDC or Web Table Corpus, which has 20 
133 million uh, tables or graph understanding through DBpedia, which is also really huge. And of course, we need the computational power and expertise. And we must mention that such attempts have been made in the past with uh, Tabbert, although uh, Tabbert cannot, uh, although these attempts have not been uh, transferred to the data to text problem, such as table to text. Also, we are talking about database democratization, uh, but there are no data to text data sets for the database domain. And one could say, then why can't we just use table to text data sets because the results of a query might look like a table and just hope that it works well for these data sets too, for the database uh, case too. But there are some problems that appear. First of all, a database, when you are, uh, when you are uh, verbalizing results of the query, there's a database behind it, which has a schema that may include information that could be uh, useful or not even useful, sometimes it might be required to have access to that uh, schema information. Also, a database will not follow conventions of a Wikipedia table. For example, here we have name and name as the column names. Why? Because it was a joint query on the movies and directors tables and they both use the word name as their attribute to describe uh, both the name of the movie and the name of the director. Lastly, a query expects something specific uh, as an answer. We do not just ask the model, describe me a table, but answer me to that specific question. And now on the, for the final part, we will talk about how we can bring all of this together, all of this together. And by all of this, I mean the text to SQL component and the SQL text to text components that were described previously by George and the data to text component too. And okay, the simple solution would be get uh, models that perform well uh, for its task, a, a good model for uh, text to SQL, another good model for SQL to text, and for data to text also, train them. And the rest is just uh, technical uh, challenges of how should we serve these models, maybe how to set up the APIs and stuff like that. But many challenges arise through that simple solution. First of all, what we, have to find a solution that is can generalize to many databases. The system must somehow be able to work, the system defined must somehow be able to work on many databases, not on a specific database or a specific set of databases under some domain. Also, database names and columns might not be, let's say, friendly for language models or for a lot of models because a lot of abbreviations are used, like user, which is abbreviated a lot of times as USR. Also, production database tend to be bigger than the uh, database in the data, this, uh, data set that already exist. For example, Spider, one of the best, uh, if not the best SQL to text and text to SQL data set, has databases that have an average for tables, which is relatively small. And there are some possible right directions. Okay, the easy one, just uh, create new data sets or expand current ones. But also maybe defining architectures and models that utilize the FUSOD training uh, uh, that are really good in few set challenges. Uh, where you don't FUSOD, where you don't have a lot of training examples, but uh, you, the, someone, the owner of the database or something might be able to generate 20, 30 data points to bootstrap the model. And also there should be defined pre-training tasks that focus on general, generalizability. And finally, some query or database pre-processing. What we mean by that, maybe you can uh, modify a little bit the query that the user was asked by the user without changing its goal, its meaning, to make it more uh, easy for the model to actually generate uh, a nice verbalization of it, or to actually uh, the text to SQL module to understand better uh, the query. Another problem, the error propagation for the user journey to be uh, considered as successful, then all three of the components must work correctly. If, for example, SQL to text fails, then 
the user will be confused and the whole interaction will be considered as failed. And that makes evaluation much harder because there must be a common benchmark for all three uh, modules, for text to SQL, for SQL to text, and for data to text. We must have a single benchmark to get back a representative performance uh, number. And also latency. The best solutions, they use models like T5. And uh, having three T5 variations, or BART variations, depending on what works better, it's not easy. It's not easy to store all of these uh, models in memory. And of course, due, it will have a really increased latency. Having a, an interaction with a user needing at least 20 to 30 seconds will be a really big issue. And we are not even talking about query execution time. We're just talking about the overhead added from the natural language interface. And, but since we're talking about natural language interfaces of database, also how this is shown to the user is really important. Like for example, there might be a conversational approach, like how many U projects are there? And uh, the uh, system might ask to confirm the query with the user. The, query, the user says, yeah, that's what I asked. And we get back the, verbal, the final uh, answer. Or maybe a search-based approach when you have a search engine-like environment where we put the query in, we press search and get back the answer or anything else. And also we have to mention that so far we talked about text to SQL, SQL to text, and uh, data to text, but there are other fields too that could really help such a natural language interface. Them being query recommendations, given a query of the user, for example, how many projects start in 2019, return back queries that the user might find interesting. Maybe similar queries or maybe queries that we think that he will find he or she will find interesting based on the history of the queries asked before. Also, data exploration is another important field. And we might do something relatively simple like show a histogram of the results, uh, if it's a numerical result, or some descriptive statistics like median average, mix, max, and mean. But also may, may be something more intricate like return in the uh, month of May of 21, 2021, more projects started than the past 10, uh, than the month May of the past 10 years. A useful insight, maybe. And uh, the, uh, also, a demo exists, but it's not uh, mobile friendly. Uh, it's called Data Agent, and it's being developed by our team in uh, Derlab, that me and George are part of, which it has text to SQL, SQL to text, data to text, and also query recommendations at that exploration. If you want, you can click uh, the link now or afterwards. We will leave the slide on. And to get you up to speed with the demo, it works on the Cordis database, which is a real world production database by the European Commission for EU projects, uh, institutions, stuff like that. There are queries that will succeed in natural language, but of course there are, there's a lot of work to be done on that specific field. And if you notice something interesting during the demo, or if you go to the demo or have any questions about our talk, you can talk to us now, contact us in the next five days, we will be here, or uh, you can send us an email offline. Thank you.